All right, I'm Russ Moore. I'm Director of Engineering for SharePoint Experience. OneDrive Mobile started that job about a year and a half ago, uh, but I've been in SharePoint for since it, before it was called SharePoint, back in the days when it was called Tahoe. Um, John Fan here is the Jim for SharePoint Portal Experience. He runs the team that manages portals. Not only the new stuff we're doing, we're doing a lot of, quite a new stuff, but he also deals with a lot of old portals, and uh, we're going to talk quite a bit today about how to make those faster. So, just to get started, our goal here today is to sort of educate a little bit. We're going to try to go behind the scenes and what we think about performance within the engineering team. Um, and that is kind of a key difference between this talk and some of the other talks you've seen from the SharePoint guys in the past. We are the engineering team. This is more how we think about it, how we run it internally, as well as some things we've learned over the years that we're hoping can kind of help you. Uh, we want to share some investments the team's making on performance and talk about some of the tools we're using as well. And our, our hope is actually that you can apply these tools, uh, some of these concepts and tips, make your own portals better, and uh, a little bit about modern pages and sites at the end, and learn a little bit about the work we're doing behind the scenes. This is a little bit of a teach you how things work behind the scenes. We'll give you tips too, that's all part of it. But in the idea that you can learn from it and then apply that in your situation and learn how to make your stuff faster too. Uh, so a little bit of background here, a little bit how we think about performance inside the team. Starting with uh, what seems like a very simple question, why do you want to make these things fast, right? Um, I think we all have seen the ads, fast is better than slow. We generally know that fast is good. But the reality is there are real measurable reasons for making a page fast versus not doing it. Microsoft, Bing, uh, as well as some, some little competitors like Google and Facebook and others have done some studies in the past that have shown that even a 400 millisecond decrease in performance um, will actually reduce volume and usage and reduce clicks. People stop clicking on search, for example, if uh, it takes longer. And, and the reality is if something takes too long, people click away. They go somewhere else. They go to another page. They go, if it's too long, they go for a coffee break, go to the bathroom, whatever. But they're not sitting there doing work, and that's not good. That decreases engagement. In addition to that, we have found from our own studies that you can take the same page, um, one page is, uh, looks beautiful, all the right styles, designers have spent a lot of time making it pretty. Um, take that same page, put another page there, change the size, the performance on it. You're going to get a better sense of satisfaction from the page that renders fast. Um, it changes and alters the way people think about the product. And the reality is here, unfortunately, I'm not talking in most of the cases here on web pages about 15 milliseconds, but human eye can actually perceive all the way down to 15 milliseconds. And what most people think of as instantaneous is closer to 100 milliseconds. And a lot of times these pages are rendering anywhere two to three to five, depending on what type of pipe you're on. And, and in some cases for big portal pages, a lot of sites, a lot slower than that. And so there's a lot of work to be done to get them down to that range where people feel instantaneous. Um, so what's the basic approach to perf? And, and I could have built this different ways, but this is something internally that we use, which is kind of our way of thinking about it. Number one, the very most important step is measure. And I'll talk a lot about measuring in a minute, but measuring is step one. It's also step two or three or four. It, you know, you're always measuring, you're always iterating around measurement. You know, if, if you decide for measuring you're so far off on the mark that you have to re-architect, it does, you know, and this is not every time, but at SharePoint, having been here on SharePoint for 15 years, we've had to re-architect the page uh, a couple times. We've had to re-architect storage and other types of things on occasion, then you rebuild and do the re-architecture. But generally, you spend most of your time in this sort of loop where you're just like, hey, what's my goal? While I'm not meeting my goal, I'm going to continue to measure. I'm going to continue to attribute, uh, figure out who to blame or what to blame, and I'm going to improve the performance. And this is something we do as a service that may or may not apply to you, depending on whether you're running on-premise or you're running in the cloud. We put in monitoring in place, and we monitor for regressions, and we build alerts. And we make sure that once we've actually met our performance, uh, we stay there. Because you know, the reality about performance is that it does not always stay as fast as it should. Um, this is extremely important. We talk about measurement. You only get what you measure. And uh, I will say this. If you don't measure it, it's probably bad. I was going to use a worse word, but we're professionals here, so we won't say that. Um, but it rots. You know, it rots over time. You add features. People want to look, make it look pretty. They put it, added new fonts. Those fonts add size. It gets worse. Um, you get regressions on the thing. 
Every time in my career, any place where we haven't measured it, it's gotten sl slowly slower, uh, sometimes quickly slower. So it gets worse. This is also extremely important. If you're measuring the wrong thing, you probably won't get what you want in the end. Another way of saying this is you get what you measure. So you, whatever the goal is that you set, whether that goal is uh, looking at median or median or 75th, that's the goal that everybody on your team is going to focus on. We use these KPIs pretty aggressively. So there's a couple different concepts that over the years we've kind of thought about perf in different ways. First one is the difference between end user perceived latency versus server time. For ages and ages in SharePoint, we were a server rendered product only. And so we mostly just looked at server time. And we assumed that everything that happened after it left our pages or after our server was all somebody else's fault. Not true necessarily, but that was just the way we thought about it. Now we're much more thinking about end user perceived latency as measured from the browser side and how that plugs into the, the world. We also think a lot about PLT0 versus PLTN. These are concepts that, honestly, sometimes we overuse. Page latency, so basically this is the concept of like, are you looking at a fully cached page? Or are you looking at it for the first time? Are you looking at a page that uh, you're having to download all the resources? It turns out that in practical real usage, what we see uh, measuring from SPO, is it about 60% of page loads are mostly cached. And I'll say mostly because the reality is, they're, with the exception of the artificial, you hit control F5, or you hit F5 right after you've hit F5, most of the time, you're not getting a complete page caching situation. You have a bunch of resources. Some are cached, some are not. Some are getting kicked out. The browser can kick them out. Things along the way can kick them out. What we find is about 60% of the time, yeah, you're getting mostly cached resources in the real world. Um, and that matters a lot because we also think when we measure stuff, we don't measure means so much. We think, and at least where I am at, at, uh, in SharePoint, we think pretty much about the 75th and the 95th. Um, we look at these two types of measurements because what we found is 75th is a sort of like, okay, this is the reasonably decent speed guy sitting in his enterprise has a good connection. 95th, this is the five out of 20 have a bad experience. The other, 90, the other do have a decent experience. And unfortunately, mean, mean doesn't work very well. A lot of people use averages. We've seen that. It's just not a good measurement. Too many things can knock that off. Median's okay if you're looking for sort of speed of light. That's not a bad type of measurement. It's just not one we look at a lot. We're more worried about the worst experience than we are the best experience. 75th and 95th, we like having both of those measurements because it gives us an idea of the person on the fast link with a decent, reasonably decent browser, as well as an idea of what the person who's on a little bit slower link is. And this brings in the sort of next point when it comes to measurement. We see very different numbers. And there's ways to think about it. Are you looking about you know, latency and throughput are different things? Um, sometimes we tend to lump them together into bad networks and good networks. There's very different measurements in SPO when we measure for day versus nighttime, uh, for weekend versus weekday. Different geos have different performance. And obviously mobile has a very different performance footprint. Uh, this is extremely important. For the longest time in SharePoint, we measured heavily using labs. Think about it. We worked on premise. On premise, we uh, didn't really have access to all the customer data, that sort of thing. We couldn't really look at this stuff in a real world scenario. So we measured heavily on labs. And what we found, even in our own uh, dog food scenarios, Microsoft's big for eating its own dog food, running our own servers, the performance was always worse in dog food than it was in the lab. The lab always seemed to run in the very best conditions. Um, it's not a totally bad thing. You can still use this lab for benchmarks. It's uh, great for comparing two small changes in control manner. You want to see what this did. You can sort of see what it did in a lab environment. But the unfortunate reality is that the passive rural world's much more representative of what other people are seeing. And so therefore, you really have to find a way to measure stuff as it's coming from real users rather than just do lab benchmarks. So attribution diagnosis, much more complicated topic. You basically just have to think about where is the problem. Um, is it network time? Is it server? Is it rendering? These are all the usual suspects. Unfortunately, network is a huge problem in itself to go figure out attribution because there's all sorts of network layers. Whose network? Our network, their network, all the stuff that's in between. There's a lot of last mile problems. Uh, this is what the user's seeing when he's sitting in that bad hotel you know, over the bad network, or maybe he's out here in the conference area somewhere. Um, and 
what we found is that in a large team like we have on the SharePoint team, we like to have budget targets for key areas. And so, so we actually have like uh, KPIs that each team is measuring that are their chunk of the problem. And we try to break that down. So now we'll talk a little bit about how we do use this in SPO and what the different types of things we, we do from a performance perspective. Um, monitoring, extremely important. We do a couple different types of things from a monitoring perspective. We have live alerts, daily summaries. What we're doing in these cases is we have a known pattern for performance. It may not be the goal we really want, but it's the performance we know to expect every day. We measure, record, have an idea of what things are supposed to look like. And if someone checks in code, um, or if there's a hardware problem or some other class of problem that causes this to fall off, we have monitors that will fire. Engineers will wake up. We'll go look at it and try to make that fast again. Um, we do regression testing. This is pre-check-in. Not all pre-check-in, but we do pre-check-in testing. We also use dog food rings. I'm assuming people know what dog food is. I mentioned it before, but this is us running our own servers inside Microsoft, running on rings. Uh, all of MSIT, for example, runs earlier versions of SPO before it rolls out to broader rings. Um, but in those rings, we have monitors that kind of pick up regressions as well. We have reports and reviews. As a director, I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, sitting in reviews, but it's actually extremely important. Uh, we're looking for trends. You know, what's the, and this is where we do a little bit more thinking about the long-term stuff. The others, we're looking against expected patterns. Here, we're trying to look for places where we can Im improve things. You know, what's the next thing to go focus on? How do we bring that number down? Um, is it 95th? Is it 75th that we want to focus on? Uh, are we looking at network issues, et cetera? We're trying to figure out there, do a lot of analysis, what to prioritize, et cetera. We get into John's session. He's going to actually show you some of the slides that we look at from a regular basis. Um, and we do benchmarking. As I mentioned earlier, real-world data is what we prefer to look at for our own performance. But the reality is sometimes you want to compare your code to, say, a competitor's product. Sometimes you want to look at uh, different types of scenarios. In that case, benchmarking is useful. I can't go look at, uh, say, competitor B. I won't name anybody by name and say, well, you know, they're giving us this number, but this is what we see in the same conditions. We try to measure those just to understand how we compare. So I'm going to, real quick, before I hand it off to John, who's going to talk a little bit about the portal stuff, I'm going to give you a real quick, short, brief history of SharePoint UI text by release and how we thought about that from a performance perspective. So in the beginning, there was SharePoint Portal Server 2001, also codenamed Tahoe. Some of you may remember it. Um, long, long time ago. This was a very early iteration into this space. Um, it was based on ASP, server-side, VBS, interpreted code. Um, very early server widget tech, similar to web parts, and it ran on a single box, so the thing really couldn't scale. Wasn't our best from a performance perspective, and we kind of knew it, unfortunately. Um, SharePoint Portal Server 2003, this was the first version that we actually brought over into the Office team, merged with uh, what became SharePoint Foundation Server, the SharePoint Team Services stuff. Um, and this we actually built on ASP.NET. We introduced web parts and Camel and a whole bunch of technologies that are still around today, and it was multi-box, so it was actually significantly more performant than 2001, uh, but nowhere near as fast as we want it to be today. Uh, this is a release a lot of people know about, 2007. In fact, if I had to guess, there's probably at least one person in the room who's still running it somewhere. Um, very popular release. We brought into that release, in addition to all the SP.NET, web parts, camel, all that stuff, we started introducing portals in this release in a big way with the SharePoint publishing. The ECM guys joined us. Um, and we started to think a little bit more about big labs running performance, looking a lot more at dog food in that time frame. Uh, 2010, we did the fast acquisition, started thinking about search-driven portals and some of those things. Uh, shared services came into play, taxonomy. This is actually the first time we started looking at client-side rendering in the mix, uh, mostly XSL, XSLT type stuff. And then 2012, 2013, a lot of you probably still running this version. Um, Search-driven publishing sites became a big thing. Introduced a lot more client-side rendering. Uh, MDS was there, content by search, et cetera. Last but not least, 2016. You could, one of the things interesting about 2013, that's the version we actually took to the cloud to go build SPO and started iterating against that. So we had to build a lot of our own functionality against that to sort of make it work in the cloud. And 2016 was the first release. We brought a lot of that back to you guys and on-premise. So we took a lot of the same things we were doing in the cloud, learnings we had from perf and reliability perspective, and brought that back down. 
So 2016 and on, now you're starting to see us move into the, the sort of future of SPFX, Office Fabric, Modern SharePoint pages. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you, Russ. So just introduce myself a bit. Uh, I joined SharePoint about 10 years ago. If you remember from that slide just now you saw, that was basically in the early days of ASP.NET. And so uh, over the 10 years I've been in SharePoint, it's been amazing to see the evolution of the technology and the richness of the portals that you guys are all building on top of SharePoint. Um, so let's dive in a bit. So many of you have seen a slide that looks like this, or a, or a graph that looks like this. And this is the W3C uh, response timing that you get from the perf counters in the browser for most of your browsers these days. I won't go into this eye chart, because I'm sure you guys can go and get bored about it uh, uh, in terms of the actual details of every single detail in internally. I want to talk to you about how we look at performance in, uh, in, when we optimize an experience in SharePoint. So back in the day, as I kind of mentioned, uh, we looked at uh, the server as the, the, the work, all the work was being done in the server. And this was actually facetiously true in the time because servers were smart, browsers were dumb. And back in the day, if you remember uh, back, in 20, uh, back in 2002, 2007, uh, the browsers had really limited CSS engines and limited uh, JavaScript engines. So we basically focused on doing as much work in the server as possible and doing as little work in the dumb clients as possible. And so what this means is we were hyper-focused on how many SQL round trips are we doing to re render a page, and how many uh, off-box calls to search and other, other shared services, and how much HTML were we sending down to the client. That's what we were super-focused, and we were basically assuming the clients were dumb. Obviously, that's changed over time as we've built richer and richer experiences. And one of the first things we saw as we started running your portals in the cloud is that we had this really big variability in terms of what users were seeing when they were looking at the, the, the server time. And so we actually broke that up. What we now call W3C response time was broken up into two key components. The first key component is the server time. That's the thing we just talked about, where it's the actual time spent processing the request on a SharePoint front end. But in addition, there's time that's being spent before, from the time the user clicks to the time that the request even gets to SharePoint. This includes times like DNS resolution, SSL negotiation, handling redirects. It even includes the time it takes to unload the previous page from browser DOM. So that, this is really important for us to start really drilling in and understanding. And because now we are running a bigger portion of that network connection between your, your users and the actual data, we could start seeing that the network impact and tuning that network was a, a bigger and bigger uh, part of what SharePoint was going to have to optimize. And that's where we spent a lot of our time. But over time, as we also ran, ran more and more of your portals in the cloud, and we saw them evolve in terms of their richness and their interactivity, we really started drilling in onto the other variable piece of the timing, which is what was happening in the browser. So I'll drill into this with an example. Uh, so basically, many of you have seen the SharePoint home. This is the out-of-the-box SharePoint uh, portal that helps users get back to their sites and activity of content they care about. I won't go into the feature set. That's actually kind of boring for this talk. Uh, but my, when my team built this, we basically took a step back and we said, well, look, this is an actual SharePoint search-driven portal. It integrates content from publishing, sorry, uh, from your user profile, from search, from the graph, from your my site. It basically sucks all that data and has to go render this page. And traditionally, we've all built search-driven portals, and, and we have this basic assumption that that's going to take a while, right? Uh, so what, how do we actually approach this problem? So I'm going to actually take you through an actual slide from one of our monthly service reviews. I'll take you through it so you don't have to read the, the eye chart. Uh, I wanted to be authentic, so I, I apologize that the slide is a little bit unreadable, but this is a slide that we actually stare at every month to go look at the end user perceived latency of what customers are seeing for when they let load SharePoint home. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is this number here. Now, this is the 75th percentile PLT, or end user perceived latency number. And what this basically means is that 75% of users who access SharePoint Home see a usable, interactive page within three seconds. Now, that's actually a worldwide number. This means that people, you can have a farm in the US, for example, but your, your users can be geo-distributed, and we're including the latencies from, from the worldwide network, right? Obviously, we've broken this down into multiple pieces, right? I talked about attributing where the time is being spent in the request. 
So you obviously see the W3C response time, and it's uh, about a second, and we've broken that into what's happening on the connection versus what's happening on the actual server. And the SharePoint homepage is a modern client-side driven app, and so much of the work it's doing on the server is just figuring out what scripts to download and what seed data to go do to render initially. And it's basically sending that app down to the client, and then, then the next phase is the app has to download into the, into the browser. And so this is a number that we, we keep a really keen eye on, because this is basically the barrier to entry for the browser to start rendering anything. Without the code to render the data, you've got nothing to do. Uh, and so this is one where we tune both the time of how, uh, what's downloading as well as the size of what's downloading and the order of what's downloading. Obviously, once you've downloaded the app, you need the data to render in the page. And so we perform multiple data fetches back to the server to go do REST calls to grab that data. And finally, once you have the app and the data, you can render, right? And so this is, this is places where every one of these phases, we can look at it, look at a number, and say, huh, what's going on? And we can go and optimize every one of these phases in a targeted way. The last thing I want to call your attention to is the search experience. So SharePoint Home, we've actually built an integrated uh, interactive search experience directly into the SharePoint Home application. And this is basically allows us to perform a search without doing a full page refresh and doing the same uh, call back to the server, W3C response time, render, download, all that stuff. We basically have already prefetched the set of stuff that you need to do an interactive search result. And so this means that our 75th percentile for search is now one and a half seconds, which is pretty much unheard of if you've, you're familiar with your uh, traditional search applications. Now, the key thing here is that we've said that we, we see performance directly impacting end user perceived uh, quality as well as success rate. And one of the numbers that we're, we're playing with right now is we're starting to see that with this new search experience, end users are seeing a 10% uh, increase in terms of their search session uh, uh, success rate just basically from a different UX model. Now, let me zoom a little bit further into browser rendering. Um, just to recap, what does a browser need to render the page? Obviously, it needs a connection to the server. It needs the ASPX response. It needs to download the app. And it needs the data, right? So we've kind of looked at this waterfall that if you look in F12, you'll see this actually happening during the, your browser rendering request. So let's talk about where we optimize. And I'll, I'll use SB Home as an ex actual example. So, I, I mentioned that we keep a really keen eye on the size of the app download and, and the way that that is being bundled and downloaded, because that's what's necessary in order to, to, to render anything on the page and in order to kick off the right data fetches back to the server. And so this is where, obviously, we've gotten all of our static resources onto CDNs. But in addition, we actually prioritize the ordering and size of what is being downloaded so that you can render the thing that's necessary for the user to interact with the page before you need any functionality that is kind of latently available. Then we took, a, we took another step forward and we said, hey, look, some data is necessary for glass, which is what we think of as the user has a usable experience, versus an experience that will download after the fact. So for example, you don't need the search uh, to be fully functional before you can see the list of sites on your site, right? And so this is something where we actually order that very intentionally to come, happen after glass. And finally, in order to parallelize the download for data and the application, we actually do multiple levels of prefetching, including uh, in this particular example, we've actually added prefetches both in the server response as well as in parallel with the app download. So those are great. That's a great drilling into an actual evolution of an out-of-the-box search-driven portal that we've built. And these are, uh, but how is this applicable to our existing classic portal investments? So one of our key uh, promises is that your existing portal investments, we want to carry those forward, and we want to make those faster, and, and we actually want to pay them off in the mobile application. So let's talk about that. So first, let's take a step back. What is the key advantage of running your portals in the Microsoft uh, SharePoint Cloud? You know, this, this, these will all sound like platitudes, and so I'll tell you why they're relevant. We've all heard that our server cloud, SharePoint Online, is highly available by design, super dynamic scalability. Why does that matter? Well, we were monitoring portals, particularly both on-prem and in the cloud, and we were seeing that reliability, obviously, is a huge component into where your end user perceived perception, as well as the latency of the actual request. If your SharePoint front ends are, are recycling at a wrong time, guess what? You might hit a you know, 30 second reboot time, right? And so reliability matters from an end user perceived latency perspective. So by really having a keen eye on, on, on reliability, that really helps give us a stable platform on which we can build. 
Then, because we've actually you know, running these portals in the Microsoft Cloud, we can optimize our data center topology to make sure that the right set of data is co-located from a network perspective and that we can properly use CDNs. And of course, because you're in the mobile, uh, because you're in the cloud, you don't have to go through crazy uh, reverse proxy hacks to be able to get your sites accessible to, uh, to your mobile devices. And finally, because you're running in Office 365, your portals can now aggregate data across multiple workloads without going through a bunch of song and dance of you having to go set that up on-prem. Now, I've had, as a DevOps organization, uh, I've been, in, been involved with many of your customer portals, uh, sorry, your portals, and both from an escalation side and, both, and in terms of engaging in terms of features. And one of the things that was, frankly, pretty much a humbling and aha moment for me was when I started seeing the numbers of what was actually happening during the rendering time of, of, of real portals in the cloud. You know, we have tens of thousands of portals that we monitor, uh, and we look at this and we say, wow, the, 90, the, sorry, the 75th percentile of server request times for all portals is actually less than a second. And for me, that was mind-blowing, because if you recall my history, I came from the old school ASP.NET SharePoint days and was like, the only thing that matters was that server time. Well, it turns out that's actually not true. Um, and so there are some exceptions, and I'll go back to those in a, sec in a second. But what we were finding, and again and again, was that all the issues, well, the majority of the issues were in the client. And we were seeing that four to five seconds out of on the, at the 75th percentile was happening because of lots of requests being done by the pages poor network utilization, and they weren't properly using CDNs. And in particular, uh, we were also seeing that a lot of content was just too big. We we're downloading too much stuff, and we were seeing uh, a lot of portals with really fancy design packages, but they were, they were basically downloading megabytes of unused JavaScript and CSS. Uh, come on, everybody knows. We've all guilty of doing that before, right? Uh, unused, unminified CSS and JavaScript. And so what was happening is the browser not only has to download that, but it also has to deal with the fact that it has to go parse and, uh, and process that, that content. And the other thing that we've seen as just basically a killer is the usage of inline scripts and styles. So on the right-hand side of this, uh, right-hand side of the screen, you see a, a wise slow report card for an actual internal Microsoft portal. I'm not going to name which one because that would be a little embarrassing, but. It's an actual portal built on by Microsoft for our own internal usage. And basically, you'll see all the major things that are being complaining about is actually issues being done on the client side. Uh, so let's drill in about lots of requests. So many customer portals I've been engaged with, we actually basically cut through a bunch of different conversations, and we look at them, and then we say, wow, you're downloading hundreds, if not 200. Uh, JavaScript, CSS images uh, to be able to go render that page. And you're also doing data fetches back to the server. Because most, many of you, I think, about, I think in one of the polls we were doing, about 60% of, of you have, have actually built responsive versions of a lot of the page portals that, that are here. And when you do that, you actually have uh, conf conflicts between downloading the, the app and downloading the data necessary to render. Now, the key thing here is that when you're downloading in HTTP 1.1, which is what SharePoint uses, there's what I call the request waterfall. I'm sure all of you hit F12, and you see requests, wait, requests, wait, requests, wait. And it's super frustrating, right? Because this means you can't actually use the actual bandwidth that you have between the browser and the, and the server. And you actually have to negotiate individual connections uh, time and again and pay the SSL negotiation cost and the DNS lookup cost. You just pay that over time. A bunch of that's obviously cash, but you pay that cost. And it's not, it's a cost that's amortized, but it, it, it ends up with this waterfall of delays and blocking. So what we are really finding is that getting this right is critical, not just from a size perspective, but from a count and the order perspective. Because you obviously need the stuff that, need, that, that will render for glass and the data uh, before you need any of the other stuff on the page, right? So I showed you a Microsoft internal portal. I'll show you data from an actual customer portal. Uh, I won't, this is a very prominent customer portal that, that we were engaged with. And this particular portal, we were, we were shocked when we ran the numbers, and we saw we were spending more time on SharePoint processing images and downloading JavaScript and images and CSS. And this is server time than we were doing in terms of processing ASPX and the REST APIs that were callbacks to get the data. So as you can see how much cost it is, not only from a SharePoint perspective, but in, time of, in terms of time, your users are waiting downloading this content. Obviously, getting this right 
uh, is actually, we've all heard the guidance before, right? You gotta minify your JavaScript, minify your CSS, remove unused code, right? This is all standard practice, but it turns out it really matters. And in fact, we actually, uh, the portal I showed you a little earlier, we actually saw the, uh, in one case, that they actually had about a 50% reduction in terms of rendering time just by doing that. Uh, that plus uh, putting all their content on CDNs. And we really strongly want to encourage you to get your content onto CDNs, uh, aka MS Wacktoon uh, is a resource that's at the end of this slide, um, and they have some guidance published there. But today I want to actually demo for you a feature that we're rolling out that allows you to use the same uh, CDNs that SharePoint does for our static resources. So let me flip to a demo and log in. Okay. Uh, so this is, a, this is a standard publishing page. Nothing magical here going on. I'm, this is actually not part of, this is only not part of the demo yet. Uh, so this is basically a boring page with three images on it, um, uh, four images on it. And basically, some of them are content, right? These, this tree and this whiteboard session. Nothing really fancy here. The point is, these are just standard assets that are being served from an asset library in SharePoint publishing site. As you can see, they're being downloaded over HP 1.1 and they're being downloaded over individual uh, connection IDs, which basically means that uh, this is using one of those six connections that the browser uh, was using back to SharePoint, right? Let me flip over to another site, and the only difference between this site and that other site is on this site, I've enabled CDN integration for the site assets library. And so what you're seeing here is that the only subtle difference is that now I'm downloading these assets from a new domain, privatecdn.sharepointonline.com, and this particular one, for example, is from publiccdn.sharepointonline.com. Now, what, what's going on here? So let's talk about public CDN. It basically works pretty much the same way that any static image works within, a, or any static content works in a, in a public CDN. Basically, you've enabled a library that says that the assets, these are design assets effectively, and the design assets are propped on demand onto the CDN, and basically they're made anonymously accessible on our, our CDN network. Now, private CDN works pretty similarly. The one thing that happens that's different about this is that we issue a short-lived authorization token for that asset so that the CDN won't release that asset to a browser until that, that, uh, without that token being valid. And, that, and the CDN will actually call back into SharePoint and validate the, uh, the, the, that particular token for, for its quality. So let me show you another deeper example. Uh, this particular page for, has a basically 180K asset. You know, 180K is not that big, right? Uh, we basically, you know, we always, obviously everybody knows you don't want to download a five meg image. That'll catch your eye. You'll, you'll figure out a way to go reduce the size of it. But 180K is not huge. Do your users really actually go and take the time to resize that image down and resample it down to the right size for their CBSs and their CBX, CBQs? Of course not, right? It's too much work. Now, many of us have heard image renditions, and image renditions are a way that you can actually tell SharePoint to resize that image for you. And so that obviously does help a bit, right? But what we're doing in terms of our public and private CDN integration is making it super simple to actually append the right dimensions into the, into the request so that from the, from the display template, you can specify the dimensions for your asset, and then we will automatically do a semi-persisted uh, rendition of that image for the appropriate size. And so you can take this 180K image, for example, and you can download 3 or 4K instead, right? Which is, you know, just trans completely transforms the difference of that. The other thing I want to call your attention to is I mentioned that SharePoint traditionally uses HP 1.1. Well, you see this funny looking H2 thing. And what is that? This is HP 2 that's been enabled on this particular CDN. And this example for here isn't super interesting. The thing that you'll look here is that hey, the connection happens to be the same connection for all those assets. Now, does that mean that those assets are being downloaded serially? No, of course not. The key advantage of HP2 is that downloads are happening in parallel, multiplexing. And to show you an example of the impact of that, I'm going to uh, show you uh, one of the demos that for HP, uh, HP2 that I saw publicly on there. So this particular demo is a mosaic of about 180 assets that are being used to download in, in parallel that are basically used to form this, this big mosaic um, image, this funky looking uh, gopher, I think. Um, and so basically, 
what's happening is you're seeing the, really that impact of that request waterfall. You're seeing the images come in over time. And this is the 200 millisecond latency, right? This is what you might see if you were browsing from Europe to a US data center. Um, even at 30 milliseconds, which is the average US latency, you can see that pixelation coming in, right? So let me just show you 200 milliseconds for HB2. So what just happened there? Well, I have a 200 millisecond latency, but I have a big fat pipe between me and that, that particular server. I happen to be on the, the demo Wi-Fi, which is not quite the same Wi-Fi as all of you are using in the hallways, right? And, and so I have a big fat pipe, and this one I've simulated 200 milliseconds of latency, but because I'm only actually negotiating one connection to the server and then multiplexing the downloads, it's actually coming back much faster. And this is really key when you look at your design assets and when you look at when, once we've written the image content to smaller sizes, right? You have lots and lots of small things that have to be downloaded, and you really want to be able to take advantage of having maximum throughput to utilize all your throughput without having to pay the overhead of individual connection latency. So with that, let me switch back here. Let's talk about what you just saw. Uh, Come on. So uh, public CDN, just to recap, public CDN makes the assets that you specify. You can configure this on a folder-by-folder -folder basis. It makes the asset anonymously accessible, and it pushes this to the same CDNs that we use for the rest of the static assets that we use in SharePoint Online. Uh, this is an eventually consistent cache, which means that when you make an update to an asset, it takes about 15 minutes for it to propagate. But by being eventually consistent, it allows for this delay and that overhead amortizes over time, right? Uh, it also means it allows for cached image renditions so that you don't pay the processing time of recalculating that, and so you don't pay the latency of doing that recalc in CPU. And obviously, you can use controls. You have a tenant level op, uh, you know, global kill switch, and obviously, you can opt in at a folder level and a site level. Um, basically, you can opt in on any folder path. Uh, for all of our CDNs, we are gradually rolling out HB2, and so our intent is to have HB2 enabled on all these CDNs by default, and we're going to actually rewrite the ASPX response for your classic portal pages automatically. So this means that ideally, you basically only have to figure out from a business perspective which locations need to have public versus private, and then we'll re do that rewrite for you transparently behind the scenes. And obviously, if you're writing custom code, we'll have APIs for you to be able to do rewriting of the, the, the assets basically over time. Now, let me contrast it with private CDN. Now, private CDN, as I kind of mentioned, has a short-lived authorization token. Now, this is really useful for image content, right? Uh, we all have seen our portals having that big news section with the big fancy roll-ups of images. Now, those images are stuff that's just in between public design assets and user content, right? But we really don't want our end users to have to really think too hard about what's public versus private. Just keep it simple. That, those assets make them private. And if you make them private, what happens is that we basically will do an, uh, we'll issue in a short-lived short authorization token that then when the browser makes the request from the CDN, it'll call back into SharePoint and make sure that that authorization token is valid. This means that that token uh, even if somebody accidentally copies and pastes and shares that in an email, that, that will expire uh, uh, after a few, a few, I think about an hour, basically. And so this basically means that the, we, have so, we have some higher degree of authorization that the user had access to that image when we render the page. Obviously, this incurs a little bit of additional latency when we actually make that request. Uh, but it's, a, you know, it's about 100 milliseconds, but when you compare it to actually negotiating individual requests up to SharePoint, it's actually quite a bit faster, and you take advantage of HP2 to pipeline the requests. So uh, by the way, uh, there's a blog that was posted just before Ignite started, dev.office.com. If you want to work with a preview version of public CDN and want to kind of kick the tires and see how it works and how it might impact your, your usage, uh, go ahead and read that blog. Uh, we'll, gla we'll gradually, um, as you can see from that was a live code demo that I showed you just now, it, uh, there are portions of this that are in prod, but we'll gradually roll this out over the course of the next quarter or so. So let me flip back and talk a little bit about uh, the server requests. Now, I kind of mentioned that most of the time, it's not the server. Well, turns out there are some, there's still times that it is a server, right? Uh, 75th is not 95th. So, how do we avoid getting to the outliers? And when I, when I engage with uh, customer portals where the time is being spent on the server, a lot of the times it comes down to a really simple problem. 
And it turns out the core problem is, and I'm not actually trying to attribute blame, I'm trying to uh, explain the, the, the architectural reason. A lot of time it is too much work is being done on the server request. Sounds simple, right? But what does it mean to be doing too much work? Let me give you two actual best practices from AKM and SWAC Tune. So number one is structural navigation. Now, structural navigation basically is architected to have a tree, your tree of content in memory in order to render the navigation. And so as you can imagine, it basically has to represent that full tree and has to do a SQL request to go, down, to go represent that tree. Uh, and because it's synchronously updated, if you make an update anywhere in that tree, we basically have to do flush and invalidation. It's basically a synchronous cache. What that means is that we actually have to keep that in sync across all our front ends. And so the bottom line is that you're basically paying about 400 round, round of trips for a simple uh, hierarchy of 50, 50 subwebs. Doesn't sound like much, but 40, there's no way 400 round trips is going to come back in a second. It's just laws of physics, right? Uh, similarly, the content by, by search, sorry, the content by query web part, when you make a cross list query, well, underneath the covers, what it's doing is it's actually looking at the schema of all the lists in that hierarchy. So if you have a complex hierarchy, it's order of n, right? And so again, you, th that, that request is just not, it's just physics of how long that's going to take. And these, these particular solutions were all built using a cache that basically assumed it was going to be amortized over time. So for structural navigation, uh, if you read the guidance, we'll, we've recommended building a uh, taxonomy using taxonomy navigation instead. It's an out-of-the-box feature that we have. Or in many cases, since many of you are designing responsive versions of your, your portals, many of you have moved to a client-side rendered uh, control that calls back to our nav, uh, nav data source. right? And obviously, on the content by query web part, Instead of doing a uh, cross-list query, we strongly recommend using the content by search web part, which in addition to being, uh, from a performance perspective, uh, improved, it's also client-side rendered, which actually allows it to, do, to operate in parallel with other search requests. So let me drill in a bit more into architecturally what's going on in those caches. And I won't go into too much detail. It's a little bit of a too detailed for, for, uh, for, the, for this uh, purposes. But the key point is that because we have to handle draft state and security trimming, and we have to keep these things in sync across all front ends, basically there's a bunch of overhead that happens when I actually go in and render these, uh, render these content from these caches. And similarly, for assets, if many of you have heard of the blob cache, uh, assets that were served from SharePoint have to go through the similar validation loop and have to pay a similar overhead. Now, what's different about the SharePoint Online topology, because we're highly available by design and have dynamic scalability, we've got farms with hundreds of front ends versus when you look at SharePoint on-prem, Oftentimes, most of your on-prem deployments have tens of servers, right? And they have daily scheduled serving, uh, this daily cycling versus on online. We have, uh, for high availability reasons, we're, we're cycling basically whenever we see anything out of the norm, right? We have basic auto recovery mechanisms. Also, online, you have multiple tenants versus on-prem, you have one tenant. So there's, in online, you have competition for the scarce resources for the cash, basic. The bottom line is, on-prem, you could hide an awfully slow page behind the fact that only one, out of, you know, one or two, uh, an hour of your users will actually see that super slow page, except when somebody makes an update, in which case everybody sees it for a few seconds, right? And so we kind of just lived with the fact that, yeah, sometimes it's slow, but hey, it's faster. It's good enough in the 75th percentile, right? Bottom line is non-persistent caches in SharePoint Online don't amortize out. And they actually incur additional latency rather than, than really improving the situation because we have uh, front ends across the world. Um, and so, the, so we are actually working to actively disable most of the traditional publishing caches and moving all that technology into persisted caches instead. The CDN investment is an example where we're, we're actively recommending uh, CDNs as a semi-persisted, eventually consistent cache rather than the synchronously updated blob cache that we used to have. So I'm going to close my section a bit uh, talking about mobile and specifically how we think about mobile and leveraging your investments in portals uh, within the SharePoint native, native app. Now, the first two problems we wanted to solve was we actually wanted to solve discovery and authentication for your existing portal investments on your mobile phone. I think many of you have obviously heard from your for users, well, it's just too unusable. I have to type this crazy, ugly URL, and I have to go type my credentials, and I have to figure out how to go type it into the screen. 
Well, with your, the mobile app, we've solved that problem, right? We have a dedicated links tab so that your company promoted links will show your portals um, that you've published there, right? Uh, and so we really are striving to, to carry forward all your existing portal investments. And many of you have built responsive portal designs. And of course, those will work great in our native app. But I really want, us to, I want, to, really want to encourage folks to think about that even harder. So to give you a tangible design, SharePoint uh, the SharePoint Home has five or six major themes of components on that page, right? And we could have, and I'm sure all of you have, uh, imagined uh, do, pulling that thing out, taking a big, fat, rectangular page and pulling it out. And how many people are guilty of like, making their users scroll through 10 pages of responsive content, right? Pretty much every one of us. And certainly, it's a necessary thing in some, some designs, right? Uh, it's, pre it's a pretty good common denominator. It makes your de content default. But for your home pages, for your core portal experiences, you really need to think harder about that. And for SharePoint Home, what we did, as an example, is that we broke the components of that page out so that the right amount of content density is on a given tab of the SharePoint native app at a time. And so you know, we, should, we should really think hard about uh, responsive design being a necessary thing, but not sufficient in a lot of cases, particularly for home pages, because that content density you know, after one or two swipes, you're just not going to have your users go to the bottom of the page. So why make them pay for rendering all that content? Um, so what are we going to do about this? Obviously, I see this as a joint, um, uh, you know, when, when these, are, these are generally you know, portals that you guys have invested a lot of money in and a lot of time building uh, great portals. And it's something that we want to carry forward your investments, right? And so obviously, what are we doing? Uh, but we see this as a partnership between your, you, know, you as portal owners and, and we as, as the platform, right? But we obviously strongly recommend using the CDNs. I, as I mentioned, uh, on mobile, it's even more exacerbated because you have a limited connection and higher latency. So getting, uh, getting your CDN uh, to at least parallelize your downloads and maximize your throughput of your downloads is obviously the first step, right? And actually, we think it's a pretty big step. Uh, we're also doing work to prefetch uh, in the native browser uh, the, C the CSS and JavaScript that SharePoint imposes on your designs. And so that way, we'll, we'll basically warm up the cache for you on the local browsers. But we're doing more work. Uh, and, and basically, over time, one of the advantages, obviously, of running your portal is that we're watching how your portals are behaving. And we're trying to create best practices for you and productizing some of our best practices into, into features that you can enable. So for example, we're exploring what it would mean to disable the actual navigation uh, elements inside of your, your, your page layouts and instead provide a native uh, navigational control that uses semi-persisted offline cache that uses, takes advantage of the fact that you're actually on a native device and you have storage. So we really want, as an example, is of a place where we can optimize and partner to, to make that go better. And obviously, if you're looking at investments in building more experiences, uh, I really want to encourage you to look, take a look at building client-side web parts. If you have a trade-off between building an add-in or a client-side web part, obviously, both are continued being supported and are, being, are valid uh, investments. But one of the advantages of having a client-side web part framework is not only that can that, that control be used both in modern pages and your classic portal investments, but you're using a modern, sorry, you're using a client-side render technology by default, and that kind of sets you up for being able to parallelize the work, uh, the load of that particular experience. And with that, uh, I think I'm going to hand it back over to Russ, and he's going to bring it home and talk to you about modern pages and the modern client-side web parts. Thanks. Thank you, John. So we're going to talk about modern SharePoint for pages for a lot, a bit here. And um, we'll, we'll go, I'll show a quick demo, and then we'll also get into Q&A in a few minutes. And we'll talk, uh, give you guys an opportunity to answer some questions or ask some questions. So modern SharePoint pages, we want to talk about this for a little bit, because all these things that we've talked about that John and I have learned about performance as we've been running at SPO, we've tried to like apply that as we've gone forward into the sort of new technologies that we're building and the way we think that sites need to be built. Um, now in the 21st century today, the way we're trying to build things. So we've moved to this client-side development model. Uh, want these things to be lightweight web and mobile. You've probably seen this slide by now a couple times. Um, we want this stuff to power our own experiences. One thing that's extremely important is that we want everybody else to build things the same way we build, and we want to build them the same way we're recommending you build. In the past, there have been way too many different ways to build things in SharePoint, and sometimes we built stuff using all sorts of secret sauce that we didn't share with you guys. We want to go forward actually making it possible for you guys to use the same thing we do, hence we're publishing the CDN feature, those kind of things. We want that to be done together. Power our experiences, power your experiences. We want to be backward compatible. We want to be able to sure you could wear these client-side web 
pages onto a backward uh, traditional portal page. And very important to us, we want to start using open source tools, JavaScript web frameworks, et cetera. Um, you see in the shape fork, there's several sessions. I'll get to the resources slide in a minute. We'll talk about some you might want to see. So what's a modern site page? So on top of that modern SharePoint framework, we're building our own experiences now. You've seen several of these this week, uh, the new news pages, the new publishing pages, the new team sites. These are all built on top of this modern page framework. And we have our own site page framework on top of that, which is how we're doing that. So what we found here is that we, can, we want you to be able to easily create these beautiful pages uh, that communicate great ideas. We want to use modern building blocks. This is all important. Um, we talked about JavaScript quite a bit, client-side HTML. Um, really important, though, is we want mobile support built from the very beginning. And this is true in terms of making these things responsive, but it's also true that we want to take all the tricks that John was talking about before that we want to apply to portal pages and apply these to modern pages outside the box. So that means that we will automatically share some of the same middle tier services that we use to make our stuff fast. We'll have a native Chrome, Chromeless mode here for these things. We'll do native caching. When you go into the modern, uh, the new SharePoint mobile app, it'll automatically cache the assets that are needed for a modern page to make that render faster inside the SharePoint mobile app than it would if you were just sending it from uh, somewhere else. We'll do asset prefetching, et cetera. And we'll also adjust the information density based on the viewport. We'll try to render it down to the right surface. Obviously, pages get better with Microsoft Graph. Some of the things we're doing that we talked about in the SP Home and the portal pages, we're going to make those persisted caches over time work better for you, make those uh, under the covers be an easy way for people in client-side pages to make the right thing happen. So on that note, I'm going to show a quick demo of a little feature we built into the modern pages to help you look at performance if you're building client-side web parts. Uh oh as soon as John logs back on. All right, so here's a modern page I built. And as you can see, it's probably the only one you'll see that's not based off Consoso this week. Um, and it's just got a couple of images and a content roll-up part in it. Nothing too crazy, just a sort of simple modern page. Uh, before I kind of go any further, I'll kind of show you that this thing is uh, responsive. There's a little feature you can use inside uh, some browsers. I won't mention which one this is, but certain browsers support this feature. Uh, it's really cool because I can basically go here and switch what type of iPhone I want. You can see, other, or what type of other phone, Galaxy, anything like that. Um, and you can see what this looks like in its responsive mode. Everything's automatically done, et cetera. Very nice. We'll go back to a full mode here. And I'm going to show you a feature we built in that'll kind of make it a little bit easier for you to uh, look at performance on your own. So what I just hit was Control Shift tilde. I apologize for the complexity of that. But you can just get on any modern page. And this includes Team Site. This includes news. Anywhere in our stuff for your own modern page, you can hit Control Shift, well, uh, Control Shift tilde. It'll bring up this little tab here. You can see the list of manifests down if you're a developer. But you can also look at performance for the page. And you can kind of see a feel here of how the modern page loads. So you got your server response time. We talked about that earlier. This is the time where we're actually round tripping to the server. You've got your application initialization time. This is the time we're loading off CDN. We're loading all of our resources into memory. We're sort of building the modern page framework into memory. Um, you can see render time. Page render basically summarizes all the time for the entire page for the left nav and the canvas render minus web parts. And then we can show you the actual web parts. In this case, I have two image web parts, and I have one highlighted content web part. Uh, the highlighted content web parts kind of our fancy name for what used to be the CBS or content roll-up part, sort of the modern version that we're doing. As you can see here, I can quickly determine that these all load in parallel, that while wow, the one that's causing my page to be the slowest, if I want to speed it up a little bit, I could take the content, the highlighted content part off, and it would speed up to about here where the two uh, images load. But in reality, 2,300 milliseconds, not so bad. This is an all right page. We can keep it on there for now. I can go add more. As I add more web parts onto the page, I can take a look at that and see what the performance of that is. Um, and it's cool about this is you can use it on any modern page, as I mentioned before. So I'm actually going to go back to my home page here, which is a uh, team site. 
one of the new modern team sites. This particular one, I've had the new news features on here. You've got news pages. You've got quick links. You've got activity. This is the current out-of-box experience on a, on a modern team site. And once again, I can get access to the same feature, control shift tilde. Boom, brings up the performance right here. I can see the amount of time it's spent on server response. So you know, hey, I may need to call Microsoft if that's taking too long, or maybe it's something else. Um, or I can actually see what, what the images and other things on the page are doing. In this case, I'm going to hit F5 again, because I think it's running the cache part. And boom. And there you go. We can see the canvas river, site activity, quick links, and we can see that, yeah, the news headline's spending a little bit of time. It actually breaks it down into the time that the part's using for data fetch and render time, so you can see how different parts are playing into that. And this is a cool and useful tool for those of you who are building client-side web parts or just adding them to your page to get an idea of the impact on performance. So on that note, let's switch back over here. Just talk a little bit about some of the resources available to you. Uh, AK Damas Tune, great set of stuff about network planning, performance tuning for Office 365, very useful stuff. Um, the new SharePoint framework, you guys have probably seen there's several other sessions going on this week, but if you haven't seen the sessions, I highly recommend you go out to devoffice.com slash SharePoint. Patterns and Practices site. Patterns and Practices guys are, are great. We work with them quite a bit. Uh, it's a community-driven effort. They have a lot of tips on their site, as well as some new uh, resources, some other types of things for modern SharePoint framework, as well as classic portals. And uh, as John mentioned, we just released this new public CDN. It's out in preview. Uh, they don't normally let us engineer types announce stuff, so it went out in a blog. But it's here today. We talked about it a bit. And I highly recommend you go out and read the blog. Um, a couple more sessions I'd recommend. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be talking again. We're going to talk a little bit more about the transition we've made, going a little bit about how we've gone to open source, modern responsive open, some of the things we're doing there. There's an Ask the Expert session tomorrow, and I'd highly recommend the patterns and practice thing. Um, on that note, uh, John and I are going to open up to questions. You can come ask us anything you want. Please come up to a mic. There's mics in a couple different places, so we can record it and answer it out, and we'll answer uh, questions for as long as uh, we're allowed to. So uh, coming up, guys. I think it's hot. <laughs> we get the mic on? Try it now. No, Check. Check. There you go. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, we shouldn't use uh, content query web parts. What would you recommend as an alternative to that? Content by search. Yeah, content by search. Okay. Can you turn mm -hmm. on my mic? Uh, so. Can we turn on John's mic too? So uh, one of the things I wanted to clarify, uh, content by query web part is usually used in two different modalities. One is for, it's for single list query, and then the other one is for multi list query. Content by query in a single list mode works great, right? Um, because it's basically one round trip. It's pay, it's pay for play, right? Content by search has to scan the entire side hierarchy in order to go figure out where all your content that you care about is, right? And so there's a thing that's actually super optimized for that, and that's content by search. Um, so you can generally use content by search for almost every scenario that you would use for content by query. There's obviously some gotchas, and if you're interested, we can talk offline about what those might be. But uh, for single list, um, it's kind of just a trade-off which one you want. But for, for multi-list, we strongly encourage content by search. Thank you. Sure. Okay. OK, I see a limitation on content search query. I think we cannot show more than 50 items, right? Sorry. We cannot show more than 50 items on a content search query web part. Uh, I believe that's configurable. Right. I cannot increase more than 50. I'm not able to increase more than 50. Uh, what's it your was showing error saying that you, it should be between 1 to 50. Content by query or content by search? Content by search. Uh, that's, let's follow up offline on that one. Yeah, okay. you, uh, you can basically ping me. I'm John Fan at Microsoft.com. OK. Yeah. yeah. I'm not familiar with that limitation. <laughs> Hi. 
Uh, you mentioned two things, uh, private CDN and the possibility to filter on authentication token. What was the question? Um, the question actually is, uh, will this be uh, available for the rest of the CDN premium stuff as well? Because we use it for our own web pages uh, in Azure. Right. And it would be perfect, nice, if you could have private content. Yeah, so our, our rough plan is that we'll basically roll out public CDN first and then private CDN. And obviously, there should be some limitations, right? So for private CDN, if you're in, let's say, Black Forest or you know, a geo that really mm -hmm. can't use a CDN like that, then, then obviously we won't turn it on, right? But otherwise, it's something where we actually plan to turn, turn it on uh, over time. Uh, from a documentation perspective, it's super early because it's still encoding. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw the public is now a bit also. Public uh, CDN is in production. It's in it's in beta, it's in preview. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as an aside, we are actively. So I, I kind of mentioned that we're going to actively uh, rewrite your URLs based off your folder configuration. Yes. And since we're doing that, uh, you know, the 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 preview documentation would say, hey, you can actually go and, and manually rewrite your URLs right now, and you can use it as is. Mm -hmm. But if you wait a couple months, I don't you know, a couple months, right? Uh, then uh, you'll be able to actually uh, just it'll, the rewriting will happen for you. And the nice thing about that is, uh, since you're using native SharePoint URLs, all the things you'd expect in SharePoint URLs will just carry forward. Versus once you hard code um, in the preview mode, mm -hmm. then you've hard coded, right? Um, right? So, so I, you know, it's something that you can definitely validate uh, that it works for you and see how it works. Um, but mm -hmm. over time, we, we do think we're going to have a breaking change. Uh, we would recommend you actually just use the uh, rewriting um, uh, for that feature. OK. And the private will come in, you said, two months? Excuse me? Private CDN will be in? Uh, it's, it's over time. Over time. Uh, over time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No official date I'll leave today. You with that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. I mean, as you can see, it's in code, right? Yeah. Uh, but we obviously need to test scalability, reliability, all those other things, right? Yep. Thank you. No sure. dates today. <laughs> Hey guys, I, uh, I saw a lot of on-cloud demos, but what about hybrid situations? Can we still take advantage of the CDN network? Or I said network twice. Well, so I mean, the CDN integration, you mean for SharePoint 2016? Or, uh, so. Well, first off, I, I would say you're, there's two different things. Yes, can you still use ACDN with on-premise? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. You should, in fact, it's not a bad idea, especially if you have uh, distributed Resources, you have people out in the field, people yeah, out in absolutely. other geos. You should absolutely continue to use the CDN. The specific CDN feature that we're rolling out in SharePoint today is used for SPO only. Over time, though, it's something we, we will think about, about whether it's an application for hybrid. And I'm sure in hybrid for the sites that are on the cloud, you'll get that advantage. OK. Then yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions. One is, um, can we get HTTP 2 on the Azure CDN currently? If on the Azure CDN? Yeah, if we're using Azure CDN as a service, do you know if that's enabled there? Uh, I'm not familiar, but there's actually a bunch of booths around Azure. Yeah. Um, I, I would ask those guys. I would ask those guys, guys for sure. Yeah. Um, second one, we're, we're not using a custom master page. We're using a custom action to actually uh, inject some stuff into the page. Um, and we find there's some latency there where certain elements on the page mm -hmm. begin loading before the custom action fires. Yep. Is, is there any workaround for that or anything we can do to kind of reduce that, that flicker? Uh, I guess I probably just left in here. Um, so I don't actually know. The, uh, that sounds like a more specific question. Maybe okay. if you can send uh, Visa and me a little bit of information on the, uh, mm -hmm. specifics on that, that sure. might be something we can explore. OK, yeah. great. Yep. Thank you. A quick question on the, the structural navigation. So we had a bunch of performance issues online, and that turned out to be the structural navigation. Mm -hmm. So we're using it more for the team sites where we're trying to find have the benefits of having the you know security trimmed as well as automatically adding sites there. Is there anything going to be online? I mean, obviously on premise it was cached. There was never a problem. We moved to the cloud. Huge. That was. I mean, we're talking like 15 seconds to load a page because of the navigation. Yep. So is there anything besides doing like taxonomy metadata stuff? Something where it's automatically give a security trim it as well as show all the sites to people. You know, I'm, I'm talking about like for team sites where there's thousands, so you don't want to. I have to go in there manually and add navigation elements in there. Right. Uh, it's probably something we've, we've looked at. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something we're currently working on in terms of improving the classic uh, structural navigation. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's just from a physics problem perspective. Yeah. If you want a model where you've got a hierarchy uh, and that's security trimmed, 
you can either move that to a search-based one, which is what, something that yeah. we have a PMP uh, piece of documentation around on how to do that. Okay. Uh, AKMS Wacktoon refers to that one. Is that the custom, like you build it into a custom, custom master page? Yeah, it would be a custom, right. it would be custom control, control that would be talking back to a data source okay. to, in order to render that. Yeah. But, but obviously, uh, you know, that's not a turnkey solution, right? That's yeah. something you have to develop. Uh, we've definitely looked at that as a priority, but it's not something we're currently investing in. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the CDN. So my primary case for having the CDN would be to have the large data, like your images, et cetera. What, why wouldn't I keep that on SharePoint? Because that's where all the end users are going anyways to get all of their, their images uh, on, on the front page. It's all security trimmed. It has everything around it. I don't have to manage a separate area for those assets, uh, except in that edge case where we're really talking about a global audience. Uh, why wouldn't I just keep everything on SharePoint? Well, for public CDN, you're getting the advantage that it's not authenticated, so you are actually saving some time there mm -hmm. on the round trip. So if you don't need to authenticate it, public CDN is a pretty good resource. And it is closer to you. It's closer to you. Not, even if you're in the same geo, mm -hmm. uh, think about where users are coming from. Sometimes they're coming from home. Sometimes they're coming from the coffee shop. Sometimes they're coming from a variety of different places. You still get some advantage from having that content delivery network and having those closer to them because these things are fairly high distributed. There's lots of locations. Um, Not to mention HP2. Yeah. But HB2 is the other one. Really? Yeah. How much are we really talking about there well, to so make that investment in a separate CDN and manage all of that? Well, so data there's, in a different location. So are you talking on just to be on the clear, the, the SharePoint on, on the public CDN feature that we're rolling out is totally free to you. Okay. So all you basically, once we get the uh, image rewriting, you won't even have to rewrite the images, the CRL yourself. Yeah. So all you really have to do is just go to, to the library where you're storing the images mm -hmm. and say, use the CDN, and it's more or less free to you. So, oh, so it's literally a switch on the It's literally a switch. Yeah. So yeah. honestly, it's really not. We haven't worked the UI you, out, but it's literally a switch. One of the reasons you roll it out in preview, you could try it, mm -hmm. see if you like it. I think you'll find that it, it's faster. Right. Okay, so if it's a switch on the, the library level, then. Well, Absolutely. Right now, if you, the, if you look at the documentation, it's literally, uh, if you go to the client PowerShell um, for SharePoint Online administration, it's basically mm -hmm. add dash SPO public CDN location. Um, there's documentation that, that you can link to. You can click through on, the, on, the, right. on that link, and it'll actually walk you through how to do that. Um, and so, so basically, yeah, I mean, but the other th key advantage is HP2 makes a big deal. Huge yeah, difference. Absolutely. And HP 1.1 on SharePoint uh, Online is going to be here for a while. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, Are you doing something about it? Huh? Are you doing something about it? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're, yes, we are. We're moving content to uh, <laughs> CDNs. CDNs, yes. Sure. Hello. I have a question. Uh, the modern pages, uh, will it cost you extra? A lot of my customers are demanding, like, you want to put a tag or a category on a news page. Some, the normal or old way is to put a new column in the content type and then put the taxonomy field so they can catalyze the news. Will there be some sort of extensibility to the modern pages as well? well Similar, or is this <laughs> the wrong uh, approach? Well, a uh, couple things. I think categories is a, would be something that we would probably consider as a feature yeah. on, on news, right? And so over time, we're going to add features to that. And so. You know, I'd be, love to get your feedback as to that as a request. If you if you go to the uh, to um, the, any any news, if you've got first release, you play with a, a modern page. There's a little feedback link, and what happens is you can actually submit an idea, and community will upvote. And we obviously monitor that to say, hey, what ideas should we go pick off the community first? But um, in general, I mean, these pages. One of the things that it's a new page model, but it's also an old page model, right? It's a new page model that looks very similar to the existing classic publishing page model in terms of its storage and its architecture and its management. So it's stored to the SharePoint list item, right? And you, mm -hmm. you can imagine if you want to add a column, then you add a column. It's it's pretty straightforward. Absolutely. Um, so there's no there's no magic. Oh, well, there's magic, but that's not a part of the magic. Yeah, and and to be fair, I think over time you'll find we'll add more and more extensibility to modern pages of all sorts. Yeah. Um, we've got to start somewhere with them, but but. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Content types and 
custom columns, definitely. Custom content types is literally one of the interesting, fun debates uh, yeah. that if you want, then we can have that <laughs> yes. off the record for, uh, as, a yeah. as a dev architecture conversation. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Do you mind speaking in the mic? Because I think they're still recording it. Oh, OK, sorry. So as a consultant, a lot of the home pages that we do, what we find is you know, we're rolling up a lot of content, aggregating it from all over the web app, and then displaying it all on the home page. And here recently, we've kind of like what you're talking about, we moved to a lot of content search yep. web parts. Is there any scalability issue? Because like, you know, um, just for example, you could have eight content search web parts pulling data from different things, from different areas, from specific URLs. Um, rolling up same content, but just, you know, different query, different categories, you know, so like we'll have tab views for different categories from, you know, from a list or something like that. Is there any issue, any kind of potential issue with, you know, don't do more than four or, you know, when you put a ton on there, that's going to really decrease something. You're just doing expensive search queries. Or Obviously like going to hit your search server. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know that we have a specific number that you can't go over. Well, this is on prem or the cloud, first of all? Print. On-prem? On-prem, yeah. So, uh, so obviously, yeah. I go to the content density problem, right? Like, mobile is the most obvious example, right? Because uh, it was fun, because I actually mm -hmm. saw somebody uh, drew me the screen, the mobile layout of their screen for a real customer portal. And I was like, that's 10 swipes, yeah. <laughs> right? And it's like, how are you going to get at the bottom of that, right? And so they're like, yeah, it is. But that's the business requirement, right? So m my only point being is, a lot of content, and even if that wasn't 10 swipes, even if on a, on a browser screen, that's you know, it's, it's a lot of content, right? And so, so you just have to tune that, uh, yeah. number one. Uh, from a download size perspective, obviously, you have to, to, you have to monitor that. I don't have a strong, like, here's the number, and, and really, in a lot of cases, it's the customer preference as to is five seconds good enough, is six seconds good enough, or is two seconds good enough, right? And those are, and they're, they're loading within a couple seconds, so yeah. it's, it's not a, a big deal, but like, we're doing a lot of taking jQuery, you know, screen yep. uh, rotators and wiring yep. mm -hmm. up to search instead of being list-driven or yeah. Some, yeah. something like that. And so we're doing, yep. you know, search-driven that but, and then tabs over here. But there are scale, I mean. Calendar, you know, calendar roll-ups over here and, you know, doing yeah. all, all search-driven. Yeah, those are, those are pretty was, common in our PMP uh, practices as well. So, right. I mean, it's a very common pattern for a lot of customers having a lot it of success It is a common pattern. I would say there is some scale point that where you could potentially, depending on, I mean, you're on-premise. Obviously, you can right. control so the size of your scope search, rollout. Sure. Yeah. So how many front ends do you have, how many query, and all that kind of stuff. So. Right. So is there anything that you can do? You know, you're talking about, like, you know, in, in your uh, team on, on the, the new sites page where you prefetch a lot of stuff like that. Is there anything that you can do? to optimize your search queries on-prem to kind of help preload. You know, like you, you know every time this page loads, we always get the same content. You know, we're always going to the same URL. We're always doing the same thing. Is there anything you can do to like to free? Well, Bob can't. We're you know, thinking about it. We're, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean besides, so, besides, you know, blog cache and stuff. Yeah, blog one cache. Of, one of the funny, I mean, um, once we started digging in and really looking at customer portals, I mean, just be super transparent. Like. There's a lot of cool ideas that I, I'm like, my backlog for things I would love to try is probably, you know, I could, I can, I can spend my whole team on it, right? Um, and so, honestly, we have a lot of cool ideas. Some of this, you know, will build over time, and some of it will, like, yeah, that's not the right trade off. The right way to do that is a modern, and it's fine. It's just a trade off, right? Um, uh, we actually have had brainstorm ideas around the problem that you're talking about in terms of making our persistent cache thing as an API available for you, as a yep. pass-through API, right? Um, it's not, we're not committing to building that yet and all that stuff, but it's something, you know, it's an idea we've thought about. Well, yeah, and I've run into that same problem that, that that other guy had about the 50 items and stuff. You have to kind of hack around it, but as far as I know and I've seen, that's hard-coded. Oh, did he say there, 50 ways or 15? Fetch it. 50, did he say? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. 50, okay, that's not surprising. Yeah, 50. Uh, 15 <laughs> there was a thing. There are kind of ways around it. You can use jQuery to overload it and do stuff like that. But yeah, the yeah. web part by, by default is hard coded to 50. Yeah. Uh, I think right. we're, thank you. Are we out of time? I think we're basically out of time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>